Welcome to the Women Inspired Podcast. I'm your host, April Seifert. There is nothing more powerful than a woman who is inspired to action, and that's my number one goal, to inspire you, my listeners, to take action in your lives. Each week, I get to interview some of the most inspiring women, and I'm bringing those interviews to you. Let's do it. Following her 30 plus years in corporate life, Margaret Smith decided to use her experiences to help people have a more direct path to their career goals, to use their talents and strengths to the fullest and to be their very best. She was trained at Coaches Training Institute and became a licensed practitioner for insights discovery and an adjunct professor at St. Catherine University in St. Paul in order to achieve these goals. Margaret also compiled her thoughts on effective leadership into her book, The 10-Minute Leadership Challenge. She gives a wide variety of workshops on leadership and career effectiveness, works with individuals and teams to achieve their goals, and is actively involved in her community. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I'm really excited to introduce you all to a wonderfully inspiring woman. I'm excited to welcome Margaret Smith to the podcast. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Great to have this opportunity. Well, I'm really excited about what I am certain we're going to dive into today. But before we get too far into that, help us get to know you a little bit and just tell us about yourself. Okay. Um, To put it all in just a very brief explanation, I've spent over 30 years in the corporate world. And um, when I decided to make a shift, I really sat back and thought about what, what were some of my greatest learnings and, and what did I really feel that I had to offer if I was no longer in the corporate world? How could I use that amazing experience I had to really make a difference in other people's lives or to help people have a, a more fulfilling career? And at the time, I decided to launch my, my business, You Excel, um, and work with individuals who were either emerging leaders. Um, high potential in their organization, struggling perhaps with some new responsibility, and to help them have a, a much better and more fulfilling, rewarding career and capitalize on their strengths more effectively. So I launched UXL, um, and I've it has grown every year. I work both with people that are seeking jobs so that I help them show up for those job interviews more Um, with a little bit more self-confidence and perhaps better prepared. And I also work with those individuals that I described earlier that are in some sort of situation at work there or their company wants to invest in them because they believe that they are part of the succession plan for leadership role. So um, I I wrote a book, The 10-Minute Leadership Challenge, which has been kind of fun to... um, so what is the right word? Um, publicize. <laughs> I created a workshop to go with it. I'm an insights licensed practitioner, which is kind of strength finder on steroids, using a lot of the Jungian principles to help people identify their strengths, possible weaknesses, and what are the best things about them that they bring to the, the work that they do and the life that they lead and capitalize on that new self-awareness. So that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, and I'm sure that more about me will come out as we continue our conversation. I am certain. That's awesome. I really love, um, I love the dedication to service that your work has, that you went into it really thinking, how can I help other people and what are the skills and, and values and strengths that I have that I would be able to give to somebody else in order to make improvements for them. Um, Tell me a little bit about that process. So I think sometimes one of the difficult things is for us to objectively, I would say, look at ourselves and identify where our strengths and where um, our abilities are. How did you go about doing that as you were deciding to move away from the corporate world? It took a lot of reflection, April, Um, a few days, and that doesn't sound like a lot, But over a weekend, from the time I made my decision to leave the corporate life and then realizing that I needed to have just, I knew myself well enough that I needed to start to have some direction. I wasn't ready to buy a rocking chair for the front porch, so to speak, and really (laughs) go into retirement. 
although, although some days it really looks appealing, I, I started to think about what brought me the most joy. Where did I feel like I was the most effective? Where did I get feedback from people, even though my job was not HR, I wasn't directly responsible for developing people or hiring the right people, but as a, as a leader in an organization and in the executive ranks of a company, I certainly had decision-making about who got what levels of responsibility and then coached and mentored many people along that path. And I really sat back and thought about what those things that I just mentioned, what brought me the greatest joy, where did I feel I was most effective, where did I get really positive feedback that, that nurtured my soul, it was all around that coaching and mentoring and supporting and challenging, asking tough questions, giving people the right responsibilities, maybe even creating, I hate to say creating work, because it had to have purpose. It wasn't just busy work. But when I saw somebody that I felt was maybe not as engaged or excited about the work that they were doing. I would have a conversation with them about that and figure out what I could give them. Maybe it was something that I was doing. Maybe I needed to include them in a project to help them see a bigger and and broader opportunity that could exist for them in the future. All of those things led me to believe or or to create um, a vision of how I might be able to do that when I'm not in the corporate world. Of course, I didn't know how I was going to get clients and how would anybody pay me for that? <laughs> would. You know, would anybody pay for that? Uh, so that took a little bit of um, extra foundation building. And then I started to look at who that I knew that I had, had worked with that were consultants or people that weren't directly uh, paid by or weren't employees of the companies that I had worked for what we had hired as consultants. And I went and asked them a lot of questions because there were Mm. pieces and parts of the work that they did that sounded appealing to me. Right. And I just met them for coffee and asked them a lot of questions. Like if they were to start today, what would they do different? What parts of the work that they do do they like the most? What do they see are some of the biggest needs that organizations have today? Where do you go to get clients? Mm. How much do you charge? Because I have (laughs) no idea. And, some, and most people, I have to say, this was a real learning for me and an eye-opening opportunity and also has made me say, what would hold me back from helping other people get started in this same space? Absolutely nothing. Because every time someone has come to me and asked for help, support, or asked questions about how I got started, we've ended up helping each other. So I, I never hold back. But the, the people that I asked were so helpful, invited me to come to meet people in networking events helped me not waste time by going to things that were not going to be um, helpful in building my business, introduced me to other people that they knew I needed to know that up until that point, I didn't even know existed, Um, guided me towards what licensures or accreditations All those initials I knew I needed to have after my name, but had no idea what they meant or why they were important, they clarified a lot of those things for me. So it helped me speed up the process of identifying where to go, what to do, how to do it, um, where to find clients, and, and also clarified for me the direction that I wanted to go. So I didn't, although I did, did try a lot of different things that I didn't feel were really in my wheelhouse or... I said yes to things I shouldn't have and then had to find help to get myself out from underneath something that perhaps was not exactly what I should have said yes to, but I've learned along the way. That's phenomenal. I really love that. And okay, so the immediate first thing that sticks out to me is an exercise that you did for yourself, but then it sounds like something that you're helping your clients do as well. And that is... You said you tried to figure out which parts of your job brought you joy and where your passion lies. And it sounds like that's something that you do for your clients. And, you know, I'll be totally honest. There was a really, oh, a decent chunk of my career where I thought there's no job that I'm actually going to enjoy. 
it doesn't exist because the fact of the matter is if you make it a job, I'm not going to like it. But that's actually not true because when I finally got honest with myself about which pieces of my job I really loved, which pieces I didn't like, which pieces I just wasn't very good at and just weren't a good fit and started to construct my day around that, it really changed. Um, what have you noticed with your clients in that respect? Is it is it easy for them to identify those things that they're passionate about that bring them joy? Or is it sometimes something that you have to work out of them? Most of the time I have to work out of them. Mm. I have to work it out of them. But, and really, it's all about the type of questions that I ask. And many times they can't answer the question just um, you know, spontaneously and off the cuff. They need time to think about it. So I might give them that as homework or right. to observe themselves. I ask them questions like um, one that I love to ask that always gets people really thinking is, where do you like yourself the most? Wow. Because that really tells them, you know, when I walk out of this type of a situation, I feel good. I feel good about what I have contributed in that situation. I feel good about the work that I'm doing, about the impact that I've made, maybe the difference that I am. I feel good about what I left behind, um, how I made people feel. Um, And so that question really gets them thinking, especially if they can't narrow narrow something down, we might go through their day, not minute by minute, not even hour by hour, but I even ask them, just just let's sit back for a second and think about today. Where did you like yourself the most today? Or where were you the happiest? Where Mm -hmm. did you feel you made the biggest difference? Think about interactions with people. What do people come for you for? Because you find that when people are walking into your office or stop to say hello to you, if you think about the questions that they're asking you or why they're even coming into your office, it starts to help you define what it is that people see in you, recognize in you, that you may not really be fully aware of. Totally. And it may not even really be part of your job, but they're, they're coming to you because they know that you have something that is going to help them get unstuck or help them because they know it's a safe environment. They know they can trust you. They can ask you tough questions and you're not going to evaluate them or be critical of them. And it it could be very focused around business. It doesn't have to be in in this realm of coaching people. It can be a part of your job. We all have many different facets in our jobs. It can be a part of your job that may not be fully developed in a job description, but it's what people know they can count on you to always have an answer for. That's a really great way of just of really uncovering those things. I wouldn't have thought to think about, you know, because we all get tapped by friends and family members and coworkers mm-hmm. and people like that for advice and and to help them move forward with something or or maybe information or whatever it is and right. it's a really great way because why would those people reach out if you weren't exactly the person that they wanted to talk to mm-hmm. if they didn't think that you had that skill yeah you know my clients really run a full spectrum of ages and experiences but i have a very different conversation with people that are new to the workforce, like a a couple years out of college, let's say, and a different conversation with those people that are on the um, end of their career, their end of their official career, but they know that their work life is not over or the impact that they can make is going to be different going forward. Absolutely. So I have very different conversations with people, but it all boils down to the same things. And and that's, you know, you're building your self-awareness, um, What inspires you the most? What legacy do you want to leave? What do you want people to be saying about you when you're not in the room? And many times we think of legacy as what somebody is going to say at our funeral. I like to think of it as what is said when I walk out of the room or what are people talking about when I'm not there? What are people thinking about and why would somebody come to me? You know, if I'm, if I was really good in, in finance, but it wasn't part of my job, but they came to me because they know I could help them figure something out. I could read, I could figure out the story that the data is telling them. 
or they figured out the story, but they're not an idea person. And they walk into my office because they're like, okay, here's the story, Margaret. What do I do with this story? Mm-hmm. And then I just start the what if. And, and all of a sudden, the, you know, the clouds part, so to speak, and all these great ideas are being generated. But they're, they're business ideas. They might not be personal ideas. They could be marketing ideas. They could be all sorts of new product ideas. And maybe that's really the skill that they come to me for. But it's, it's, you know, it has nothing to do with what the work that I'm doing today. I use that as an example of a client that um, may just need to re- recognize, oh, now I see a skill that I have that I just, you know, never even recognized that as something that is of value to anybody. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and what's really interesting about what you're saying is sometimes I think, I think people look at, um, look at life and their career as something that happens to them or Mm. even maybe slightly better than that. People are used to thinking about Uh, managing their career and taking an active role in it in the sense that they're going to maybe ask for a promotion or they might um, think about uh, a project to take on. But what you're talking about is an even more hands-on, active, responsible role where you're talking about you know, your job is one thing, right? This is, this is like yeah. the thing you go to and the thing you do every day and not to push it aside because it's very important for us to, you know, work and pay bills. But what you're talking about is so much more important than that. This is the foundation on which your entire career is built. This is what are your skills? What are your values? What do you enjoy doing? And stack all those things up then figure out the job that belongs on top of them. You're talking about something so much more foundational. Yes, ab- absolutely. Because you can, no matter what your job responsibility is or the title you have or um, the description that's been given to you, you know you, you, you may need to be able to do all of those things or at least find the right resources to help you because we can't be, we can't, there are very few people who do every single part of their job really, really well. Right. And that's why you need a team. And if you can recognize the things that you're really good at and who on your team or the resources that you have available to you that can help fill your gap, not only are you really smart in doing that, you can learn from those people a lot and not struggle so much, but at the same time, you are showing them the value that they bring. And I think that that is something that is so critical for a leader is to make sure that people know that you recognize the strengths that they have and that you are tapping into those resources in a way that demonstrates the value that you believe that they can be. And people today are um, needing to feel valued more than ever before. Mm. We're moving so fast, making decisions quickly, expecting an awful lot from people. And we don't take time as much as, I'm not sure that we ever really did, but it just seems like things are moving so fast today. But even taking time to show people and share with them what you really value about the work that they're doing and how you're going to put them into a certain uh, spot or give them some some a, a project like you mentioned or give them a role within a project that you're working on or even just say I need you for one hour a week to help me overcome this challenge that I'm facing because this is something you're really good at mm-hmm. and I I could really use that from you right yeah I want to make one point before I jump into what you just said you know we were just talking about this foundation and really taking a critical eye about at you know who you are and what you value and what you're good at. I just want for people who are listening to this to think about how how aligned does your current job or career or what you do in your day, put it that way, um, how you spend your day, how aligned to that foundation does it feel like it is? Because you know, in, in times when you start to feel like you need to white knuckle 
to me, that's a really good indication to myself that something is not working for me. It's not aligned well. Not that everything should feel easy, but the gritting my teeth and constant white knuckle is a good indication to me that there's a mismatch there. And I just want people to think about how different your day would feel if you didn't have to do that, or if you had to do it less than what you do now and how important the things that you're talking about doing and, and doing the hard work of really uncovering what that foundation is, how important that work is. It's huge. I, I think that once you've done the work, the even more difficult and challenging thing is to have a conversation, not just with yourself, but a conversation with the people who are, who ultimately are making decisions around the roles and responsibilities, the projects, the job, the work that you are assigned. Oh, yeah. Or asked to do, um, invited to do. And having those conversations is really challenging. How do I ask for more? Mm. How do I, how do I um, even ask to be given an opportunity without it just sounding like I'm begging or I'm... Um, uh, just, you know, feel more better than everybody else. And I've helped any number of my clients, a lot of them, put together a real business case to have a good, clear conversation with a supervisor or a decision maker that shows that they've thought it through and they're pointing out the reasons why. And remember that it's like selling anything else. You have to establish a need, and it has to be about the person sitting on the other side of the desk. Mm. They put you in this position. If they give you this responsibility, if they allow you the opportunity to challenge yourself in a new way, what benefit is it going to bring the company, or what benefit is it going to bring that person that you're asking to help you make this move or um, have this additional challenge? Right. And you have to be, walk in there with confidence and clarity around what it is that you want and why it's a good business decision for the company or the organization to give that to you. Right. Why you is that so hard? Day, you know, well, why is that I, so hard for us? We, I feel like we have such a hard time walking in and asking for what we need and feel like we deserve or asking for more. Why is that so difficult? I wish I had the answer to that question. <laughs> I really did because I know it was tough for me when I was in the, in the corporate world. And, and now I, there, there are days that I think, oh, man, I would love to go back and redo the year 2007 because I know I would do some things differently. And the outcome for my business, the people that worked for me, the customers we served, potentially could have been different. Um, and certainly, certainly for myself, um, I would have, I would have felt better about the work that I was doing or felt more status, more gratified by it, or maybe we would have even delivered different results. But I, I didn't think about it until now. Right. So now I'm, now I'm using that to help other people. I think it's fear. I really think it's fear. And I also think that we assume that the people who are in those decision-making uh, positions are watching us and are aware, but they aren't. Uh, Again, you know, our, biz- our, our jobs have become so big um, just because organizations have changed dramatically over the past 20 years. There are la- layers that are gone. Um, we're, doing, we're doing far more with less, not just more with less. We're doing far more with less. They've become much more technically challenging. We use technology in ways that we didn't before. So I I just think that people aren't taking the time to really watch all the individuals that work for them and keeping track of when they're ready, what they're ready for, and then coming to you and ask and, and sharing that with you. Right. So I think it's up to us to own it and it's up to us to ask for it. Um, but you have to be, pre- we have to be really well prepared for that conversation. So you have kind of, you've mentioned a couple of times this notion of uh, leadership 
And, you know, you mentioned your book and that has to do with the concept of leadership and certainly what you just spoke about, keeping track of where your team is at and who's excelling in what ways, that's certainly a part of leadership. What does a good leader look like to you? You've been in this, this, you know, space for so long and you're helping people develop into great leaders. What does that look like to you? That's really a loaded question (laughs) Um, because I think, oh, wow, Um, there's so many different pieces and parts to it. I I think one of the, there are two words, maybe three. I think courage is huge. Um, Courage to, to be observant. Courage to give praise. Courage to allow other people to be highly recognized and not feel like you have to be the person in the limelight. Courage yeah. to make some tough, tough, tough decisions. And, you know, many times we think about courage as, as uh, risk-taking, and, but risk, risk looks, um, has a wide variety of definitions also. Because we could be um, taking a risk by giving somebody some additional responsibility that no one else um, was willing to do. Risk, risk might be making a business decision that is huge, like a big acquisition or um, a customer decision or a pricing decision or a product decision or a service decision, a new business venture. Those are huge things that we take risks on. But usually there's a whole team of people, whether that's finance and legal and marketing, that are involved in that um, to make sure that all aspects are, are covered and that our risk is mitigated as much as possible. I'm thinking more of the personal risk that we might be taking. Right. Um, there's, so I think courage, I think authenticity, knowing yourself well enough, having you know, um, that level of transparency that um, makes people see the human side of you. Asking good questions, um, but in an, in an encouraging and supportive way and not in a challenging and demeaning way. And trust, boy, Um, without trust, without trust in an organization, if people can't trust you as their leader, um, it just falls apart. Mm. Everything falls apart because they don't, uh, it just stifles innovation, creativity. It stifles, it makes people fearful. Um, I'm really balancing when I, I that when I said fearful, it made me think of balancing head and heart. You have to be smart. Maybe that's also where courage comes in. So you have to know what you're doing. And that's the, the functional competencies of, of being a leader. We have to know how to do the job. But then the heart part is knowing how to treat people so that they want to do the job that they've been assigned, that they're excited to come to work, that they give it more than, than the 40 hours that they're being paid for. Right. Um, or they, you know, maybe they don't need to work 40 hours, but while they're there, they are so fully engaged and excited about the work that they're doing that they don't even know that they were there for eight hours, that there's, you know, the time just flies by. Right. And yeah. they, they're actually putting energy into the work rather than sucking energy out of the organization. Absolutely. You know, there's that quote about how uh, people don't quit jobs, they quit bosses. And I think oh, there's a true. lot of truth to that. Absolutely. In, in most exit interviews, it is the supervisor. And, and, and that actually is, is one of the reasons that I developed my program, Build a Boss. Because becoming a first-time supervisor, leading people for the first time, or managing people, supervising people for the first time, can be career accelerating if you do it really well. And the people love working for you, and they'll give, it, they'll give everything that they have. Or it can be career ending, but not just for you as the new supervisor, it can be career ending for the people that work for you too. And there've been several organizations that have hired me to coach someone that they've just put into a leadership or a management supervisory role. And all of a sudden they see people leaving Uh. and and it's a red flag. Something's not right here and we need to figure this out. And in exit interviews, it comes up you know, some of the characteristics or the leadership um, 
faux pas that this individual has demonstrated and and they know that they need help. Fortunately, in many cases, the um, upper leadership of the organization is willing to make an investment in that person. And we work on a plan to turn that around. But Build a Boss is really designed for first-time supervisors because making that transition from being an individual performer to now having to inspire and motivate others to get the work done is a huge shift to make. And if you don't do it right, not only are you impacted, but the people that are reporting to you in that role are impacted as well. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And I remember that as being one of the most difficult times in my, in my traditional career when I was in a more normal job than what I'm in now. But that was an extremely difficult transition was going from uh, being in charge of doing the work to leading a team. It is not a natural transition for a lot of us to make, however well-intentioned you are. Yes, absolutely. There's so many times when I see the, the best sales rep as an example, being made the sales manager. And sales start to drop and, you know, all different things are, start to happen. Um, so it's not always, the right person isn't always the person who performed best in the previous role. Absolutely. So as you've thought about your path uh, through doing this work, was there ever a time that you doubted yourself? I mean, it, it can be a pretty big undertaking to leave a normal corporate job. Uh, you know, we've had the we've had the opportunity to get to know each other a bit before this, and um, you know, you you had a very successful corporate career and it can be very difficult for people to leave that behind even if their passion lies somewhere else. So did you ever doubt yourself and how did you how did you deal with that? If I said every day would I sound <laughs> incompetent? <laughs> um, honestly there are days when I see what um, is going on back in my old corporate world. And I get the itch to say, and I say to myself, oh my gosh, you could have been a part of that. Um, But then I I realized that I would have missed the opportunity to do all the, and meet, to do all the fun things that I now am doing and meet the people that I've had the opportunity to meet and work within so many different organizations and really learn a lot more about myself, but, but also learn about how business is run in a wide variety of places. So I've, I'm still continuing to learn. Um, but to answer your question uh, about doubting myself, yeah, um, I think that when I first started, when the first person raised their hand and said, can I hire you? It was like this huge amount of, of doubt just like fell off my shoulders because up until that point, until I got the first person who was actually willing to pay me, mm. I, just, I doubted myself constantly. Um, and then once I had that first client and then they were so satisfied and happy that they referred me, referred their friend or another coworker to me. And then when a company called me, so um, I, I would have to say that nearly, nearly every day, there is some level of self-doubt, um, but you just sort of persevere through it, and the, the clients are really the people who confirm it for me every day. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I also ask myself, I ask myself a lot of questions. I have to admit, like, you know, what, what am I afraid of? Why, why would I doubt myself? Um, So I, you know, you have this constant dialogue with, what am I afraid of? What could possibly happen? What's the worst that could happen? Um, And then it it does um, convince me or reassure me, I guess is a better better term to use, that everything's going to be okay. Yeah, I think uh, Tim Ferriss, who's an author, he does this interesting exercise where 
as people are trying to decide whether they should do something like take on a new challenge, open a new business, whatever it is, they've, they've got this thing in front of them that they want to try, but they're afraid. He leads you down this path of trying to think of the absolute worst case scenario absolute worst, most awful thing that could happen. And then he says, all right, so say you're in that situation. What are you going to do now? How are you going to handle it? And it basically says, okay, the chances of the absolute worst thing happening, I'm not going to make any money and I'm going to lose my house and I'm going to be destitute and not be able to eat. And (laughs) I mean, the worst case scenario, (laughs) it's highly unlikely that that's going to happen. But even if it did, you can find a way out of it. You've got a path that you've figured out how to get out of it. So why not try? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, and it's so true because you can, you can put all those barriers in front of yourself and then go back and do exactly what he's suggesting. And I try to go about six layers deep. You know, if somebody says this could happen. Okay, what if that happened? What next? What next? What else could happen? And we start to kind of uncover all these different things. And then we figure out a path how can we prevent that from happening? What would we wow. do if that did happen? And, and pretty soon you realize that you're a smart person and you have solutions for every obstacle that you can think of that would come in your, in your way. And you have people and resources that would guide you and prevent those things. And once you start to uncover the barriers that are the things that are in your way and stopping you, you can build them into your plan. So that they don't happen or you, you reduce the likelihood that they could happen. If you just go blindly into something, you're, you could hit, you could just hit that wall. And if you haven't thought about it ahead of time, that wall just gets thicker and deeper and harder to overcome. Mm-hmm. But if you've thought about it ahead of time, you already have your plan for how you're going to break through that wall. Maybe you're going to climb over it. Maybe you're going to walk around it or you're going to, you're going to have recognized that it's coming up and you need to do something different. And so you, you take a left turn so that that wall isn't there anymore. Right. On the flip side. without Without a plan, without a plan or having thought about those things, um, you could, you could hit that wall and, and it could be, it could slow you down much more dramatically. So I like to plan for those things and be ready for them. Then they don't, they also don't seem so big once you've thought through them. Absolutely. Totally agree. So on the flip side of that, aside, you know, this opposite side of the coin from doubting yourself, what do you feel like what has been your biggest achievement? When you look back on it, you just feel amazing that you were able to accomplish that. What would you say that is? Wow. That's a, that's a huge question. Um, I think having people tell me that I made a difference in their life. Hmm. Or a supervisor of a person call me and say, I am so glad we hired you to work with him or her. Um, Because all of the promise that we saw in them, or we knew that they were the right person for this job, and you, you helped us groom them or help them see that in themselves, and they are flourishing, and the people around them are flourishing as well. So I'd, I'd have to say that it's, getting, that it's getting feedback from the people that I work with. I've, I've had um, parents hire me to work with their newly graduated son or daughter mm. because they've sort of exhausted all the advice that their kids are going to listen to them for. <laughs> and and I've, I've had, you know, parents come up to me years later and say, I can't even begin to describe for you the difference that you made in Jim's life or Rachel's life. Um, they are so happy with the work that, at the work that they're doing. Um, they found the right spot at a time that they were so unhappy and um, feeling 
feeling really bad about themselves and that they wasted their four years in college and a lot of money or feeling like they were never going to find something that would bring them the level of satisfaction and feel good about the work that they're doing. So just, you know, I guess to boil it all down, it's when someone reaches out to let you know the difference that you made. That's got to feel so wonderful to know that you stepped in at a time somebody needed you and you made a big difference. It's got to feel great. Yeah. You know, the, the other, the other time that, um, I really feel good or have some sense of gratification is when other people that want to do the same thing that I'm doing that are maybe afraid to leave the the comfort of their corporate um, position or the job that they have, but they know they're not happy or, and they're, they're really scared and they come to ask me, how did you do it? And what did you have in place that made you feel comfortable taking this leap? And, and that they, they see me as a success as a, as I don't, I kind of sit back and go, really, you're here in this office asking me these questions. (laughs) I feel like I, I have a long way to go, but they see me doing something that they wish that whatever it was that they could overcome their fears or that they could have somebody help them, um, see the path that they should take or the journey that they feel that they need, that they'd like to go on and that I can be there, that they've come to me. I mean, Oh, that is, uh, gives me a great deal of satisfaction. Absolutely. So what's your, what's your next big goal? Mm, My next big goal really is, um, two things. Number one, I am writing my second book. Exciting. Yeah. Uh, the first, I started to write a second book. When I, when I wrote the 10 minute leadership challenge, it was really focused on leadership in general for everybody. And then there's such a, a demographic change taking place in the workforce today that I'm now trying to um, write a book around using the same format as the 10 minute leadership challenge about different scenarios that people will run up against that a newer person in the workforce and, you know, maybe it's more the millennial brain, how they would handle that situation versus how that more experienced person would handle that situation. And how can we tap into both of those resources effectively and come to common ground? Because we both have something extremely valuable to offer. But I see a lot of resistance right now in the workforce and people will come up and will ask me questions like, what am I supposed to do with these millennials? Uh, I don't, I don't understand them. Um, They don't, they don't do this. They don't do that. They don't value this. They, they ask for that. And, and millennials coming up to me and saying, I just don't get these old people or (laughs) the baby boomers that are in the, why won't they let me do that? Why, how do I ask them for more? How do I, um, uh, how do I plan my career? How do I have that conversation? And communication is changing so rapidly that it's really impacting our, I think that that's also part of what's impacting our ability to just have those conversations, that we're communicating a lot differently than we did 20 years ago or even, even 10, five years ago. Yeah. So that's the first thing is my, my next book. And I have another book. It might be a little ebook, just around courage. Um, because every time I do my workshop on the 10-Minute Leadership Challenge and people go through the little assessment that I do around the 10 attributes that are featured in there, courage always comes up. I uh-huh. wish I had more, more courage. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to write just a, a small book about courage. But then um, the next big thing that I'm really working on is expanding my um, workshop and speaking um, engagement. I like, I love working one-on-one with individuals and I think I'll always do an element of that. But when I can impact a larger group of people, um, I just feel like if I've given them one nugget and I have all sorts of follow-up things that I offer. So I, I hate to walk in and feel like I just had people drink through a fire hose. Mm-hmm. 
and that miraculously in a 40-minute keynote or a three-hour workshop, they're fixed because it doesn't happen that way. Right. You need a conti- So I've been um, developing these cohorts, which is what Build a Boss really is. It's a, it isn't just a one-time thing. It's a five-part, five or six-part series that people would participate in and build more of a cohort um, experience for people. So those are the two or three biggest things that I'm working on right now. I love it. In the vein of wanting to help a group of people, if you, you know, think back over everything that you've done, what advice do you have for other women? Mm. Well, it wasn't really until I left that I, and I sat back and I was doing that reflection that I talked about earlier that I realized I was living someone else's career dream. Many, many times, my next job was a tap on my shoulder and someone saying to me, Margaret, this is what we need you to do next. And most of the time I said, okay, when do I start? Instead of really thinking like, is that a good fit for me? Right. Am Am I going to be able to really do my very best work in that position? And when I sit back and think about the reasons that I was tapped into was because the person that was tapping me on the shoulder needed me to achieve something for them. It might be solve a problem, um, overcome a challenge a business was facing, whatever, whatever the real goal was. But I was doing that to help their career. Now, in the right. long run, all those things may have helped mine. But I also realized that there were some things that I should not have said yes to. Um, that, that may have, if I said yes, I should have asked more questions when I said yes. Like, what is it that you see in me that makes me the right person for this role? Ooh, and what is it good. really, like, let's peel back the onion here. What is it really that we need to be accomplishing in this position? Why are you giving me, why are you asking me to do this? Right. Because I would have been really clear around what they were expecting from me instead of just believing that I could figure that out. And the sooner you ask those questions, the better. Because you're allowed to ask a lot of questions in the first two weeks that you get a new job. Yes. And the longer the time goes, the harder it is for you to get out of your chair and walk down to your manager's office and ask those questions. But you need to be ready to ask them right away. Yes. Oh my gosh. You could do an entire workshop on those key pivot points in your career or those key points in your career and what questions you should be asking. Just that one about what is it about me? What do you see in me and why are you asking me to do this? Like what, what skill set do you think I'm bringing or what value am I bringing? That's so illuminating to tell you what, what their expectations are. Exactly. Because there were times that I thought, oh, they need me to come in and really work and develop these people. And, you know, I've got a great team and, um, and they're expecting things from, from the individual. And then six months later, I find out through a conversation with my supervisor that, no, it had nothing to do with the team. They already knew that those were good people. They didn't need to be any, you know, okay, that's great that you're continuing to develop them, but there's a huge problem over here. And that's really what we brought you in to solve. And okay, I'm working on solving that problem, but that wasn't my top priority. And it was just, you know, a lack of clarity around really what the expectations were and not asking those tough questions. And they don't even have to be tough questions. They just have to be some basic questions um, that sometimes just go unasked. Right. And, oh, my gosh. Um, the, the, other, the other part, um, April, that I don't want to... Um, disregard is um, that when I look back, something that I really um, wish that I had done was to truly map out a career path for myself, a career mm-hmm. map. I hate to say path because they're a path. I mean, it could it could look really when I work with people on developing a career path today, it looks more like a tree and not this you know, straight line or even a wavy line, but it's more like a tree because there are experiences that you, when you say, you know, here's where I am, 
and here's where I want to be. And it could be the very next level. It could be the next job title. It could be in a different department. All of, you know, there's many different places it could be. But along that path, there are different experiences that you have to do. There's things you need to learn. There are people you need to meet. There are challenges you need to face to prove that you can overcome them. There are things you need to do for yourself. And they are all branches on that tree. And so it, it, isn't, it isn't a straight line. Um, and, and so I need to be able to sit down with my supervisor and show this tree that I've really thought about the things that I need to demonstrate I can do or understand or contribute and ask for their help in getting, getting these experiences and coming with ideas and suggestions. To walk into somebody's office today and say, I'm ready for the next promotion, or I believe I'm entitled to a raise, without having the story together as to why you believe that, or what you want to experience between now and the, if you walked in and said, by the end of the year, I would like to seriously be considered for the next job grade or a promotion, and here's what I need to experience between May 1st and December 31st, can you help me gain some of these experiences? Mm. Your, your supervisor is more likely to sit back with that map that you've drawn out and maybe even add some things to it, which would be great to know that, and also say, yes, let me introduce you to so-and-so who can um, help you better understand this. Or we need to build your financial acumen. So, and you've got that on here. So how about if we set up um, an opportunity for you to spend time with the finance manager? What are some things that they could do for you or that you would like to know more of? And here are some things I think would be great for you to better understand in that realm. And so you can have a much richer conversation if you go in well prepared. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. I love it so much. Um, I just love the work that you're doing. It, it really helps people align a major part of their life. You know, one of the, one of the really big chunks of our life really is our, our work and our career. So um, you're really helping people align that to their passion and, and their, their skill set and what they're really great at. And I think that's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I just have one last question for you, and it's the last question that I ask every single person who I interview for this podcast. Um, we are compiling a playlist of motivational songs out on Spotify that people can listen to when they need just a little pick-me-up throughout the week. And I have to ask you for your contribution to our Spotify Power playlist. So I need your most motivational song. Oh, gosh. My most motivational song. Mm. Well, it isn't actually, it's one verse from a song that I use periodically, and that's that Oz didn't give nothing to the Tin Man that he didn't already have. Ah. And and I love that, that one verse because it's true. You have everything inside of yourself that you need. Oh, I like that. Do your very best. And when I say that to my clients, they usually sit back in their chair and go, yeah. So help me find that. Aww. And when I start to really doubt myself or to think, you know, uh, you don't know what you're doing. I sit back and I just recite that verse to myself and I go, yeah, that's right. I don't need some man behind the curtain. I've got it all within myself. That's perfect. That's absolutely perfect. It's so in keeping with everything that we talk about on this podcast. I, I adore it. And I'm so grateful for you um, taking the time today to talk with me and to, you know, share the work that you're doing and share so much practical um, advice and just knowledge with us. It's really valuable when we can walk away from one of these interviews feeling like there's, there's things that we can apply immediately in our lives to make improvements. So I really appreciate you being here and for sharing so much with us today. That's great, April. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm really grateful to be able to share some of my experiences. And if a few people benefit from my story and the messages 
that you and I shared today, I'm eternally grateful and happy for them. I hope you loved that interview with Margaret Smith. Now, while I am sitting here compiling her episode, I am drinking a wonderful glass of wine from The Fabulist. It's a Petite Syrah 2015 from Paso Robles, California. Unlike a lot of the wines that I drink, I actually paid for this bottle. I did not get it for free, but I can highly recommend it. Um, wonderful flavors of dark chocolate, ripe cherry, black pepper. It's a really full-bodied, great red wine. Highly recommend it. All right, so let's get into some of the awesome stuff that Margaret talked about because there was a ton in this interview, and I'm just standing up cheering. The biggest question that I want to ask you right now is one that Margaret brought up in her interview, and that is, what brings you the most joy? That's huge. I mean, who takes the time to ask themselves that question? Not enough of us. We don't do it often enough. What brings you the most joy? And what's cool about Margaret is she focuses on people's careers, which is a massive part of their life. As much as we want to admit it or not, we spend a ton of time focused on our job and our career. And it's really important that we find one that aligns with our best self. So I love how she got down to the very like foundational basics of figuring out what your talents are, figuring out what your values are and what your interests are. Like, where are you your best self? And does your job align to that? Can you imagine if it did? How would your life feel? Maybe it feels like that already. Maybe you have one of those amazing jobs where it just aligns with what you want to do and who you are. That's incredible. And it's worth it to ask yourself those hard questions and uncover those pieces about yourself to make sure that what you're doing every day and where you're putting so much of your life, oh my gosh, is it aligning with who you want to be and where your talents are? It's such a great question. The second thing that I really want to highlight about what she brought up is she asked this awesome really straightforward, like obvious question, but oh, it's so worth thinking about. What are you afraid of? If you actually want to make a change, what are you actually afraid of? And then, okay, say that happens. What, what then? And then what would you, what would you do after that? And what if that happens? Okay, great. What would you do after that? I love how she took such a practical approach to almost catastrophizing and then just coming up with a game plan for how you're going to handle all of the, all of the catastrophes. If you do decide to make this leap, that was so cool. And related to that, she mentioned the idea of basically living somebody else's career dreams. And that's why she ultimately left her, her corporate career. So Margaret was extremely successful by all measures of the words on paper, any way that you would objectively measure somebody's career success, success. She was extremely successful in her corporate career. And ultimately she realized that that all of that success was just fueling somebody else's career dreams. And she wanted to put all of that motivation and all of that hard work and passion towards something that she really cared about. And that's amazing. The last thing that I want to say about Margaret's interview is she mentioned the concept of a legacy. So what legacy do you want to leave? And the way she defined it was, what do people say about you when you're not in the room? Well... I'm looking around the room that I'm in and Margaret's not here. And so Margaret, this is what I will say about you when you are not in this room. You are an inspiring, incredible, passionate, caring, giving, intelligent, amazing woman. And I'm so grateful for the lessons and the stories that you shared with us on this interview. It was just wonderful. I really appreciate you being with us. 
For those of you who've been listening, I can't thank you enough for listening to these episodes and reaching out to me when you have comments or thoughts. I'm getting recommendations for women who should be future interviewees. And it has just been such a cool experience. And let me tell you, if I end up, by the way, if I ever miss a week where I'm not releasing an episode, that means like something has blown up in my own life and I've just had to attend to it. It is so not for a lack of incredible women to interview. So Margaret's interview actually officially took place and I officially recorded it like a month ago. So kudos to her for being really patient and waiting for it. These women are everywhere and I'm finding them everywhere. So keep sending them to me because I want to share their stories. There is so much value in us learning from each other and being inspired by one another. If you're enjoying this podcast and you're enjoying these episodes and these interviews, please pop over to iTunes, drop me a rating or a review. It helps my podcast come up on searches when people are looking for inspiring content that they want to listen to every day on their commute into work, which hopefully aligns with their values. Let's hope. If not, call Margaret. Um, I really hope all of you are doing well. I really hope you found a lot of value in this episode. I hope it makes you think about how you're spending your time. And as always, have an inspiring week. 